Good afternoon, everyone. This is Professor Dunham, and this is a short weekly review. Um, as I wait for maybe more students to come in, um, I'm going to just go over some things um, that you might see again or, you know, get prepared for HESI. I hope you're doing the um, HESI practice assignment in your module and also the HESI practice exam. As you can probably see, the questions are different. They're not going to, they don't, they, they're not going to basically ask you what's going on with the patient. Um, they're going to give you like a scenario. Oh, let me put it this way. I shouldn't say that. I should say basically that they're going to probably give you a scenario and then they're going to ask you for your nursing care. That's how I want to put it. Um, they're not going to ask you for definitions. That's what I want to get at too. Um, this is a um, HESI. What it is, is a final exam. So again, it's only 50 questions. So you have to basically, and there is math. So you have to basically understand that um, they're going to hit on the what? highlights okay and so i have already sent you a lot of hesse concepts um from the very beginning i did that i did on field development antepartum and intrapartum and i just sent you hesse concepts on the um postpartum newborn and medications i guarantee there'll be a medication on hesse um so let me go over um, what what to expect? This is from a HESI that was just last December. Okay, just last December, so it's not that long ago. And these are highlights I can give you. I don't have the question per se, but we try to have incorporate some of those into your exams. So the first one I'm going to go over. Um, tell you about is one on wet diapers. There's always a question on wet diapers. I've seen it over and over again for the past five years. And so we're looking at the newborn's output. Now, I've always told you to know, and let me tell you, back in December, my students got 100%, so them got it right. Okay, so you've had it on quiz and you've had it on your... Um, reviews. So please, um, and then exam number three, I believe you had it on. Okay. So please go over that. Okay. Um, vital signs for a newborn. It's right in your HESI book. I hope you have been opening your HESI book, but if you haven't, now is the time to open that book. Um, know the normal th vital signs for a newborn. It's in your PowerPoints. So I would suggest you review your PowerPoints that we have given you. Um, thrombophlebitis, prevention. Okay, so what we're going to get up is you're going to get them out of bed, early ambulation. All right. Um, T-P-A-L, T-P-A-L, which means term, uh, preterm abortion and living. If you do not know, what gravin and parent is now, you need to go back and to review that. Guarantee it. They either have a gravin and para or they have a GTPAL. And when you do gravin and para, P does not stand for um, preterm. No. So go back over that. A lot of you got confused on that. All right. The next one is supine hypotension. Remember we talked about that where you put the patient, pregnant woman on her back and her blood pressure will go down. So um, you want to review that. Spinal anesthesia. Um, they, they probably put spinal anesthesia instead of epidural, but no, there's always risk factors for spinal. And what's the biggest one? post um, Dora um, uh, he, uh, headache. Okay, so review that. Um, what's the cure for a terrible spinal headache would be a um, blood patch. 
Okay, the next one is R-H-O-D, immune globulin. We know that is what? Rogam. I told you they're not going to say Rogam to you. They're going to put R-H-D on it. Okay, this one says refusal. So there's two tests that we can do. Um, you know, everyone has the right to refuse. But there's two tests that we can do if, uh, when the baby's born on the core of life. And that's indirect and direct coons. So I want you to look that up. Indirect and direct coons tests. Um, radium warmer, um, applying the temperature probe. Yes, and we don't want to cause an infant to get too hot. Then you would have hyperthermia. So we're gonna put a little temperature probe on the right side of the infant. Um, right around where the liver is and um, it hooks right up to the radium warmer and it gives you exactly what the temperature of the infant is. Um, pseudo administration, which is um, happens to little girls, little newborn um, girls, because they get um, the hormones from their mom. So therefore, um, they can have a little bit of bloody discharge. It is normal. It happens because of mom's hormones. Okay. And we, a lot of times we just have to reassure the new moms that it's okay. Um, prolapse cord. They love prolapse cord um, and the action. So when you discover prolapse cord, one, you can, the examiner can leave the hand inside and push the head up again, uh, away from the cord. So remember, the, re the, the thing behind prolapse cord is to get the pressure um, of the head off the cord. If, we, if you don't, the baby is going to get diminished blood supply, diminished oxygen, and could expire. So you want to make sure that the head is off the cord. So if you have a Trandellenburg, if you have a hospital bed, you can put it into what we call, now listen up, they call it a deep Trandellenburg position, deep, okay. Um, the, again, think of what you're doing, you're getting the head off the cord. Um, if she's at home and she discovers that her bag of water broke and she discovers a cord hanging, she gets into a knee chest position on all fours, get her head down, her butt up. Again, what is she doing? Getting the pressure off the cord. Okay. And of course, call 911. A lot of times I had patients that came um, right, uh, right in the elevator. Okay. They were still on the, in the ambulance stretcher coming up the elevator and um, they came into the unit like that. We went right to the OR. Okay. Now, prenatal visits, this goes back to in the beginning. So you want to go over your prenatal visits and um, what are, how, how does a woman get her visit set up? Remember, um, the pregnancy is divided into three trimesters, each one being 13 weeks. So um, we see them, you know, every four weeks in the beginning, then it goes every three weeks, and then and then uh, at the very end is like every two, one week. Okay, now uh, be sure to go over that though. Okay, it's been a while since you've had that, and I understand that. Um, the next one, preeclampsia. Mm -hmm. How do you assess for preeclampsia? Remember, elevated um blood pressure, showing protein in the urine. Okay, has unrelenting headaches, right? Double vision. So, and we want to prevent eclampsia. And eclampsia is what? With the seizure. Okay, so we're going to give magnesium sulfate to prevent a seizure. All right, so go over preeclampsia. Um, postpartum hematoma. You just have that on exam number three. And yes, they have it on HESI. Um, postpartum hematoma is in the using the vulva area. Very, very, very painful. Um, it's a collection of blood. It could be from a dramatic um, delivery. So we want to go ahead and um, get her uh, ice packs on it and try to get some pain relief. Okay, oxycodone um, helps. 
but it is unrelenting. Okay. Um, postpartum changes. I would go over that a little bit more. What happens to the body? Remember, I always have a lot of questions like, um, they like a question, say, on how does the uh, involution process go? And in order to answer that, you would have to know what the involution process is. Okay. And so we want to go ahead and <laughs> go over the postpartum changes and what happens to the mom. How does she adapt? Um, and how does, how does baby adapt? And um, so please go over postpartum changes. Remember, um, we don't want our patient to hemorrhage. So if she's bleeding and she um, has heavy lochia rubra with some clots, that's not normal. We got to check the fundus now and do frontal massage. Now, remember, they always like to put a question. And I think this was on question um, exam number three. And some of you did miss this. It, the question was about um, the uterus being above the umbilicus and over devi deviated, or they use the word displace over to the side. What would the nurse do? Well, I know that I have to check the bladder. Remember I told you way back in week one, the bladder lies right underneath the uterus? Yes, you want to check the bladder because what happens is that the urine fills up, right? Makes like a little, blows up the bladder and then pushes the bladder up against the uterus. That uterus will go up and go over to the side. And so she's going to continue bleeding. So you have to empty the bladder and you can empty it by, you know, least invasive always. So I'm going to offer her a bedpan. Now the bedpan, if she doesn't void in the bedpan, okay, understandable. So probably a lot going on and she probably may be a little swollen down there. That's why she can't void. Um, then I have to catheterize. Okay. And then once you empty the bladder, you can actually see that uterus come back to midline and back down to the embolicus. So remember, after delivery, the uterus is midline and at the level of the embolicus. So you, that's where I wanted to go back to. Okay. Um. They have another question on postpartum and it's postpartum assessment. So I'll be going over that a little bit in just a minute. Remember that bubble heat, postpartum assessment. So I'll go over that. And then um, you want to go over the newborn medications such as vitamin K and um, the what the eye ointment, the erythromycin eye ointment, and how it's um, put into the infant's eye and where. I'll let you, that's right on a PowerPoint that we had, so I'll let you look that up too. If you don't know that, please get, take notes to these. Um, perineal laceration. Okay, remember a laceration is a, what? A trickle of blood, okay? So she will bleed but it's a trickle of blood and just keeps coming. So, you know, you do your assessment and then you go back and, you know, you see my hmm, pad is, it's kind of full already. Hmm, that shouldn't be. So what do I do? I, I go ahead and get a chucks, put my pads on it and put the time that I changed that pad out. Okay. All right. And then I'll see my time period. I go back in. I check on my patient again, do maybe some vital signs. And what am I picking up? I'm, I'm, I see another pad. And now her heart rate may have gone up. So I don't want my patient to go into hypovolemic shock. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to call my doctor and say, well, I changed Mrs. Jones's pad. And now 15 minutes later, I'm changing another pad. I need you to come in. He'll come in or she'll come in and assess it could be a laceration that's high up. It could be a cervical or high vaginal. It could have been from um, a fast delivery, precipitous delivery, okay? It might've been from a big baby coming down, okay, a macrosomic. So therefore, uh, you wanna go ahead and um, 
find out why. Because your patient um, could bleed. And remember, tachycardia is your first sign that your patient is going into hypovolemic shock. And um, I know some of you uh, talked about in your discussion question number three about, you know, why would you give her so much fluids? You have to. You have to give fluids to, to build up. Um, the volume so that, you know, you can get more oxygen flowing, okay? Um, so tachycardia, because another sign too is right at the delivery. Remember I told you that mother's pulse is bradycardia, okay? Now you go in, you find on your postpartum assessment that her heart rate is increased, that that would be a good question on assessment on postpartum patient. Her heart rate's increased and increased to um like say one twenty. What is the nursing priority on that? Okay, I've got to see what her amount of logia. That means that she could be bleeding somewhere. Okay, all right. So that's on laceration. All right. The next topic on this HESI exam was um, member mathematics. Um, I think you'd be fine on PO dosing on kilograms. Remember, 2.2 kilograms equals what? One pound, right? Okay. So you want to make sure that you're, you know, able to do that math. There's no reason to get a math question wrong because you've all been doing very good with your math. The next one is on oxytocin and the action of oxytocin. So we know oxytocin, one, um, comes from the pituitary and it stimulates contractions. Okay. It's also helps um, with the letdown of the milk. Um, so we give oxytocin in a couple of ways. We give it through um, synthetic version of it is called pitocin. And, and, and what that does is stimulates contractions. Okay. So we can do an induction of labor and we're going to give, um, um, oxytocin or pitocin um, in milliunits just to mimic labor, and get her going. Okay, that's one. The other reason we give oxytocin is after the delivery of a placenta. Afterwards, because we want to contract that uterus so that we, it's kind of putting pressure on that placenta area so that she doesn't bleed. Okay, so that's the action of oxytocin, okay? So you want to maybe, if you don't know about it and you want to know more about it, look it up, all right? Oxytocin. Uh, nipple care. We talked about that quite a bit. And um, it's, an, it's essential because uh, I don't want mom to have cracked nipples nor red nipples because that would lead to mastitis, which is an infection of the breast. Okay, and uh, a lot of ladies that get mastitis, they quit breastfeeding. So I don't want that to happen. So what would I do? I would make sure that the baby latches on properly. And um, once the baby latches on properly, he gets the entire areola in his mouth and he has a good suck and um, it, it won't hurt her nipples. And then afterwards, she can just wash it with some plain water. Um, there's no need for any special cream. Sometimes women take the milk from the nipple and just smear it around the nipple area. Just it's kind of soothing, but that's that's all. And sometimes what I tell moms is after um they breastfeed and they do all that, they wash and everything, just let your um nipples air, you know, open to air. You know, just walk around the house or sit in your bed for a few minutes in some privacy and let your nipples dry. Okay. Um, and then use always a good nip um, nursing um, bra to um, hold your breasts up because they get very, very heavy. All right. Um, newborn hepatitis B immunization. They always seem to have that on the test. So please go back into your newborn and look up hepatitis B immunization. It's right in HESI book. Um, so it's real, real simple there. Newborn diapering. Um, yes. The newborn diapering, I think that was on your exam number three. Um, you want to make sure you have a cord, you know, and um, you want to make sure that the diaper itself goes what? Underneath 
the cord. You never put the diaper over the cord, just underneath the cord so that you can let the cord dry out too, because it needs to dry out and, and, and then it'll fall off. Um, they had a question on NST, non-stress tests. So we know what that is. And that is, um, that's uh, fetal well-being, a test for fetal well-being, and where you put mom on the monitor. Now, listen up. This is the equipment. And they had a question on this. And I'm going to tell you that students in December, they got 100% correct. But kudos to that group. Um, yeah, so NST equipment would be the monitor, electronic fetal monitor, in which you put the ultrasound transducer over the baby's back. Okay. And then you put the toco diameter over her fundus, because that's where the contractions start. Remember the powerhouse, the fundus. Okay. So you want to go ahead and get her all side up, get her comfortable. You know, a lot of times we do these NSTs in a recliner. Um, I even put a, I even sometimes put mom on a little tilt um, to the left side uh, and put a pillow behind her and make her really, really comfortable. Okay. They have, to, it takes about 20 minutes um, to do this test and they have to push to give them a little buzzer to push. And when they feel the baby move, they're going to press this little buzzer. What that, what it does, it makes an arrow on the monitor. And that lets us know, we can correlate that to how the heart rate does during that time. And what we want to see is acceleration of the fetal heart rate, 15 beats above baseline, lasting 15 seconds. Okay. And we just need like two fetal movements within 20 minutes. Okay. Um, I always like to get more, but, um, and then we know the fetus is okay. All right. So that's a test for fetal well being. Now, mom can have some water. If the baby's not moving, sometimes um, women come rushing into the clinic to have these tests done because maybe they have preeclampsia or diabetes and we need to keep a close an eye on the fetus. So um, we can give them water, okay? Um, sometimes the, these babies are so stubborn. So sometimes we have to give them orange juice as long as mom's not a diabetic. And that helps. But they always the, the latest studies, let me tell you, show that water works just as well as orange juice. And then also um, we can do an acute stimulator where it's a vibration. And um, we just put this little, it's a little tool and we just um, put it on mom's stomach and we press the button and it kind of goes, it's a like a zap. Okay, and we zap, we call it zapping the baby, and it doesn't hurt the baby, but it kind of like wakes them up. Okay, um, so uh, I'm gonna tell you back in the 70s, um, we used to use a pot, boom, okay, and then they came out with this, um, fancy, um, HP did, um, Mula Packer came out with this fancy monitor that had an acoustic stimulator attached to it and what i tell you this is my remember um what it looks like is a larynx it's, a, it's just a plain old larynx you know the one that they used to for uh, people who have maybe um throat cancer and they can't um they can't talk anymore well um it's kind of larynx and i tell you i bought a larynx back back in 1988 um for my unit so we could have that, okay? And um, AT and T put it out. So just just to let you know, okay? Nurses, we do what we got to do, okay? And then they have a um, a question on multi para, and a multi para that has has a boggy uterus, okay? Well, what do you think? All right. Well, they're they're more prone to a boggy uterus after delivery, um, because they've had babies before so the uterus is maybe not contracting like it should be so we have to oh we have to wake that uterus up and say hey you got to contract okay so again we're going to look at the bladder make sure she doesn't have a full bladder i'm going to massage the i'm going to massage the fundus of the uterus i'm going to be giving her iv pitocin 
okay? And I might have to give this patient methogen. Um, so methogen is used to stimulate the uterus to contract. It causes a lot of afterbirth pain. So let me tell you, if she's getting Pitocin through the IV, which is strong, and she's getting methogen IM, that uterus is going to contract. Um, so be sure that you go over your medications. Again, oxytocin, methogen, um, carbopress, hemovate, all those, okay? All right. Um, and what they're used for. And um, when you're studying, what you want to do when you're studying, you always want to say, what am I, what's my nursing actions? Like, what am I looking at? Okay. Like, I'm looking at a uterus that's boggy. Okay. What's my nursing action going to be? Okay. If you don't do something, she's going to hemorrhage. She's going to bleed to um, death and go into hypovolemic shock. And I don't want that. Okay, so what's what am I going to do? Okay, look at those questions that way. Um, medication during pregnancy, please look the, the, know that. Um, maternal bonding. We promote what bonding through skin to skin. Get the baby on mom's chest, um, mom's chest, baby's body, and you can do APGAR um scores right on doing a. Um, skin to skin. It's called a kangaroo. Very, very important. Very important for the child when he, as he grows up, they get, um, they know that they, they're wanted, they're loved. Um, Lokia. Oh yeah. Lokia amounts. It's right in your HESI book. It's right in your textbook. Look it up. It's got really nice pictures of how much is scant, how much is moderate, and how much is large. Um, late decelerations. Um, late decelerations is um, decelerations that the nair, uh, the the most lowest part of the D cell is what after the contraction. Now I'm gonna tell you how they probably ask that question. They probably give you a scenario, and um, they give you a scenario, and um, they're going to um, uh, describe it to you. And based on that description, what would the nurse do? So you have to know what a late looks like, okay? And so is the, where the nair, the lowest part of the D cell is what after the contraction. So um, this baby is in trouble because late decelerations are caused by uterine placenta insufficiency. Remember I told you the placenta and, the, and, and uterus, they're not getting along anymore, folks. And so they're not perfusing the uh, blood and which carries oxygen for the fetus. So baby goes, okay, I can handle this for a little while, folks, but not very long. So what's going to be my action? Remember lion, L-I-O-N. I'm going to turn my patient to the left lateral position. I'm going to give IV fluids. I'm going to give the baby um, oxygen, uh, mom, mom, excuse me, mom oxygen. And I'm going to call for help because I know that this baby, um, won't tolerate this a lot okay they can't they can't and so if you have recurrent or we call repetitive late decelerations they cannot tolerate it they're ready um iron rich foods oh yeah they usually give you a nice little scenario and they ask you which foods are high in iron i know you know it so you want to make look that up and also, what you, while you're looking up nutrition and iron foods, look up uh, also what a vegetarian would eat. Okay, all right, because we have a lot of vegetarian patients. Um, intrapartum pain management. All right, so this lady's in labor, so you need to know. Um, probably to answer this question, you probably need to know the stages of labor and the phases of the first stage of labor. So we got the first stage, right? And they're gonna probably tell you how many centimeters your patient is. All right, so if she's, let me see, um, she's five centimeters. Okay, so I know that my patient's five centimeters, she's in the active phase of the first stage of labor. So if this is a good time to get an epidural, Okay, good time to get an epidural. Now, if she decides she doesn't want epidural, you could give her good time to give her a narcotic, okay, to relax her. Um, but knowing that um, 
you have you know she the narcotic is not going to take away the pain of the actual contraction it just relaxes your uh, patient um, during the resting tone um, in between each contraction so narcotics um you know it, uh, they're okay but always have narcan um, on the radium warmer in case you need it um getting back to the management though of pain um i have non non-pharmacological uh, means so i know in your book i can actually see the page um to go over those non-pharmacological methods okay if she decides that she wants to go all natural that's fine just know that in the latent phase you know you can have her out walking and doing and don't have her laying in bed that's never good um unless she has other you know problems of course um and then we get her through that um it's like diversion and distraction hydrotherapy um oh efflorage skin stimulation really nice way of relaxation of that okay um also that's for the that'd be for maybe the uh, latent phase okay or as you know it early um then as she gets more into say four to seven centimeters um if she wants an epidural that's a that's a good time to get those epidurals in um during the active phase um when she gets into transition is not a good time um to to give her a narcotic no guys it's not because uh, again it'll cross the placenta and go to the infant all right so you don't want to do that um and then epidural uh during the transition phase it's just really it's just um it's really a waste put it that way i guess um because one um by the time the epidural really takes effect she'll probably be complete She's done, all, she's done all the hard work, but now we want her to push. And um, though the epidurals today are much better than they used to be in the past, um, anesthesiologists have really know how to, uh, how much medicine is necessary. Um, I need my patient to push. And if you're numb from the waist down, you can't, you can't push. Um, and no matter how hard, I mean, I had patients that tried so hard to push and they just weren't pushing. Um, so, cause they couldn't feel when I did the perineal massage, they couldn't even feel my fingers. So I knew they couldn't push. They were all, they were pushing more in like their, their neck, their veins were coming out of their neck. And I said, no, this is just a waste. So what I do is I have them like sitting up more and let the baby come descend. And then as soon as she feels the, um, urge to push then i knew the epidurals wear it off so again that's how you're going to manage your patient um pain control during labor um so i've, I've had quite a few patients over the many 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 years and um basically was able to give them more or less painless labor um because again i i i work like a midwife i get them out walking in the very beginning okay in the shower, hydrotherapy, okay, relaxation, effleurage, rocking, pelvic rocking always does beautiful for um, labor pain, um, diversion. Today, they you can put movies on in the in the labor room, watch your movie. Um, support. I always believed in support in the room, okay. So if she doesn't have a support person, she can hire one, and she can. It's called a doula, and a doula. She's not a um, per se professional. She, but she does go through a certification course to become a doula. I know that for a fact. So um, I've been through the course <clears throat> and um, can be hired. But anyway, I don't do that anymore. But anyway, it's a doula. Is a really she's a really neat lady, and she helps with. Uh, she's an advocate for the patient. Um, she works with. Um, everybody in the room with the nurse. I used to work all the time with the labor and delivery nurses. And um, she does the medical and I do the support. 
Okay. That's always nice, especially if you don't have anybody with you because it has, um, studies have shown that if you have somebody in the room, a support person, you can tolerate the pain, the contraction much greater. Yes, you can tolerate it better. Okay. So that's interpartum pain management in a nutshell. <laughs> All right. The next one, um, oh, infer infertility testing. Um, how your client reacts. Yeah, well, infertility is a special area of nursing. Um, and um, basically, how you handle these patients are, it's in a very soft tone. Okay, very soft. Um, you listen. You listen more in, in infertility patients. They need to talk. Okay. Um, they're coming in there maybe for hormonal testing. Um Daddy has to go for sperm analysis. Um, it's very emotional. Um, every woman uh, wants to have a baby at some point in their life. They might have waited till they got um, their all their careers done. They may be in their forties now, trying to get pregnant. Uh, so there is a lot in in this. So basically, you listen and um, and respond to your patient, okay? All right, induction. Induction, um, we know we're putting the patient into labor. She has not started labor. So we're gonna give her Pitocin to what? Induce, get her started, rip up, come on, rip up. Um, but you're giving Pitocin in, a, in milli units very, very small amount, and it goes through a pump. And you must uh, be monitoring this patient, must um, have a, uh, must know what the fetal heart rate is at all times, and the contraction pattern. I do not want to cause hyperstimulation to the uterus, and um, where contractions every, every minute, up and down. There's no relaxation because the baby will not tolerate that. Remember when I told you the um, baby actually takes his breath during contraction. That's why I don't want it longer than 90 seconds in duration. No, 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 no. And I do not want contractions one after the other. That's called tachycystole, and that has effects on the fetal heart rate. Um, so I don't want that. Um, so I'm going to monitor her all the time. And when they're on, when, and they're on a monitor. If they got pit going, they're on a monitor. And then um, I'm going to make sure she's peeing, okay, because oxytocin has a way of decreasing that. So I'm going to make sure she's she, her output is good. So, of course, she's getting an IV. So whenever you have an IV going, I want to have INOs, intake and output. Already. Also know about your patient. Okay, she could be a grab at a five, pair of four, and she still didn't go into labor. Okay, so now you're inducing her. She's that's a that's a multiparous patient, and so we want got to be very careful. Okay, because we just want to give enough. Years ago, we used to give nasal pitocin. Okay, and we basically just sometimes just take them, whip them by their nose, and they start contracting especially your multi paras. Okay. Um, so you want to know about your patient, her gravita para, how was she did with her last pregnancy, um, last um, labor, okay? Um, is she going to uh, want an epidural? Okay, because once you start um, giving getting those contractions to a reg regular rhythm, um, you're, they could contract, okay? Because uh, Pitocin is quite strong. Okay. Um, let's see, ID bands on babies, they do not leave the um, labor room or the, or the OR, the operating room, wherever the delivery took place without getting an ID band on. So there's two bands that go on baby and one on mom and one on the support person that mom has um, delegated that to. Okay, and on there it has mom's name and MRN number and um, and it has babies, I am a female, male, and the time and um, and who and who delivered. Okay. Um, let's see. Hemorrhage. 
hemorrhage. This one, yeah. Now hemorrhage, you got to know, okay? So um, just to make a definition of a hemorrhage is uh, 500 or greater for a vaginal delivery, 1,000 mLs or greater for a C-section. Okay. Um, never good? Nope. Uh, could be um, uterine at atony that's causing this. Um, it could be a placenta previa that's causing this, okay? And so you want to always worry about when your patient comes in and she's got a um, diagnosis of placenta previa that you get it right on the monitor very quickly. If you have heart tones, um, get mom's blood pressure and heart rate, okay? So um, placenta previa will, um, if they're, if they're bleeding, um, they will be C-section. Now they can hemorrhage after the C-section because the way the placenta was laying right across the cervical os, um, caused those uterine muscles, okay, to be, um, to not to be able to contract as well. So therefore she can hemorrhage. So you have to be, um, alert to that. Okay, 92% people got that right. That's pretty good. Okay, all right. Um, another question on hemorrhage, and I know they always do like hemorrhage, um, is your multigravida. And we kind of talked about that already, I think. Okay, I hit on it. So if you're not too sure, um, go over hemorrhage with the multigravida. Okay. Yeah, they would um, have a tendency to bleed more too because of the uterus not being able to contract, okay? Um, here's another question, guys, on hemorrhage. There's quite a few. There was like three questions in a row. One was related to a complication such as placenta previa. The next one is uh, um, hemorrhage uh, with a multigravida. And this one is just on plain old hemorrhage. Okay, so you always want to be alert. Um, you want to be massaging the fundus, okay? Empty the bladder, okay? Um, and you got the perineal pads. I think we went over this quite a bit already. So if you're not, don't understand hemorrhage, please look it up. I put on, on under announcements, you got a great um, uh, sim that I put on there. Um, and you probably had a sim in your on your own campus, so on on postpartum hemorrhage, um, you know the medications given for postpartum hemorrhage, and um, and the reasons. So I would just categorize categorize it that way and study it that way. All right. Um. Here's a question on gravida and parity. So they love G and P. So uh, again, um, go over that if you don't remember it. And remember, there was another question on TPAL, so you need to be, be sure to include the present pregnancy, the present pregnancy, okay? And um, remember, twins is considered one pregnancy, okay? Um, for massage, they have it on here. So that's like, Maury, four questions on hemorrhage and fundal massage and displacement of the uterus. Oh, I think that's five. That's quite a few points. So, if, so make sure that you go over that. All right. Um, food and labor. Okay. Can we feed her in labor? So according to when she comes in as to what, what, what phase of the first stage of labor is. If she's not even in the first stage of labor and she's now in the second stage of labor, I give her some ice chips, you know, because maybe she her lips are kind of dry. She got an IV going, but look up food and labor so that you know when you can give them um, food and when not. Um, and then baby's first void and first stool. Okay, we went over that when we did newborn as to when they should void and uh, and their stools. Okay, remember you just had it on exam number three about the breastfeeding mother's breastfeeding stool of an infant, and it was what seedy and it's yellow. Meconium is your first um, stool, and it's tar and dark. Okay, all right. Um, they do have a question on first trimester, um, the persistent vomiting. 
Okay. So that would be um, persistent vomiting would be hyperemesis gravidarum, right? Um, persistent. It she just constantly, right? Um, we've got regular nausea and vomiting in pregnancy, but that lasts usually the first trimester. Okay, 13 weeks. Um, but we can give her some anti-emetics to help her. Um, what else can we give? We can give ginger. Ginger. Remember, in nursing, we always go from the least to the most. So least invasive with giving her ginger. Um, like ginger ale. I used to give my patients ginger ale. I used to take the uh, ginger ale because they would oh, so, be nice when they um, when they have something in their uh, wet their lips and I used to take a spoon and I used to get all the fizz out of it okay so if you don't remember go back into the different trimesters that's how I would study it folks I would um, list my trimesters one two and three I would put out each by each trimester the week's gestation and then underneath each category I would go ahead and list what what happens in each each one Okay, and um, I, your HESI book does that very nicely also. So you want to go ahead and, and, and look at that. And that's how I would study to know, okay, what's normal and what's not normal. Okay, and I always say, if you know the norm, you can pretty well uh, pick out the apple. Okay, got to move on. Don't want to be too boring here. Um, fetal heart rate. Normal fetal heart rate, 110 to 160. Anything below 110 is what? Bradycardia. Anything greater than 160 is what? Tachycardia. Okay. Um, and we know to put mom on her left side. Remember, lion, I told her, went over that. Fetal heart rate deceleration. Okay. So if we have variables, they're caused by core compression. If we have earlies, deceleration that's caused by head compression then we have um a okay and what am i doing i'm doing veal chop and then we got um the last one is late decelerations and that's caused by placenta or uterine placenta insufficiency so if you don't remember veal chop go back in and look at veal chop okay um episiotomy for the first 24 hours, you've got those beautiful ice packs. Put the ice pack on and episiotomy for the first 24 hours, okay? Um, I also will go over retta with you, okay? Well, I'll do it right now. R is for redness. E is for edema. Um, our second E is for um, ecchymosis or bruising. Um, and the what, D is for drainage, okay? Any drainage coming from the episiotomy? Got to pick it up. You don't want your patient having an infection in a episiotomy. And then you have uh, approximation. How well approximated are the sutures? Okay. So remember, first 24 hours, what are you going to put on your patient's episiotomy? Hmm? Hmm? Listen, patient. Ice packs. Okay. Ice packs. Okay. Um, the next area, I'm going to tell you, 100% got that one right. Yay! <laughs> I love it. Um, diabetes. Okay. So um, to go over newborn assessment um, of a baby that's born to a diabetic mother. Okay. Remember, jitteriness and tremors, um, low blood sugar. Okay. Please go over that. They do have a question here. Um, cocaine, cocaine exposed newborn. What do I think of when I hear that? Neonatal abstinence syndrome. Okay, so um, be sure to review that. Um, medication again. There's another medication, carbopress. They like to put those medications on Hesse. All right. Um. All right, we have a few more to go. Um, breastfeeding concerns. Um, proper hold, holding the baby, proper latching on, um, proper nutrition. Mom can have 500 extra calories um, in her diet. Um, if a mom is um, has an HIV, she cannot breastfeed because everything goes to the breast. Okay. 
Um, breast engorgement. If you get mixed up, and I think we had a question on breast engorgement on the exam, uh, be sure that you look that up. And what do you put on mom's breasts for breast engorgement? I think kind of got mixed up with promoting the flow of breast milk, okay, with breast engorgement. There's two different, again, you have to read the question and you're going to ask yourself, what's the question asking me? Um, breast changes in pregnancy. Go back to the beginning. Um, remember when mom's adapting to pregnancy and how the body changes? I gave you a great cartoon on that. So go back to that cartoon and review it now because now you've had all this information and so that should even make more sense. It'll be like a review. A fun review. Get your crayon on and, and color it in. Okay. They always like this one. And I want you to look this up. Is in, um, under the topic of antipartum. And it has to do with x-rays. Um, so look that up. Can a mom have an x-ray? Um, and to what extent? Okay. And then bongy uterus. Oh, they love that bongy uterus. So, and they have on to hear a massage. So, boggy uterus. You have to massage that fundus. So, you're going to go to the top of the uterus, and it's called the fundus, and you're going to get it, like, see my hands? I'm kind of cupping it, right? And so, my other hand, I have it underneath the bottom of the uterus. So, I actually got the, the uterus in my hand right now. And so, I am massaging this uterus. It's a pretty good down deep massage okay now <clears throat> that's for a patient that had a vaginal delivery now c-section i'll let you know too we still assess the fundus okay even though they have a big old bandage on their tummy i always have to make sure that the fundus is firm okay again i don't want to have her hemorrhaging so, but when you're in massage when you're feeling the fundus of somebody who has c-section i'm still going to feel but i'm not going to go like like really pressed out deep, 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 okay? And sometimes what I would tell my mom is to put a little pillow um, over her incision area um, if when I massage her, okay? Um, but you gotta be able to feel it, folks, because your patient could die on you, okay? Remember, boggy uterus, hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is never good, never, never good, okay? Okay, so remember that. Because then from hemorrhage, what happens to my patient? You can go and have a, a hypovolemic shock. I don't want my patient to die on me. Okay, so um, I'm going to what? Massage that fundus. Get down deep. Okay. And then the second stage of labor. Okay. What's, that second stage of labor is what? Think about it. Pushing, right? I'm completely dilated now. I've gone from transition to second stage. And if you don't remember this, write out the stages of labor, first stage of labor, the longest la um, stage in the whole process. It has three phases, the early latent phase, the what? What's the next one? The active phase. And the last one is transition. Transition, I'm from now, I'm, going, I'm completely dilated. So now I'm going to the second stage of labor. Second stage of labor is I'm pushing. Okay, push, 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 right? And so we push. That can last about up to two hours. Remember, an OA baby, oxidable anterior baby, perfect, head down, tucked nicely down, um, makes for an easier pushing stage and um, easy delivery, easier. Okay, now, a baby that's OP, which means occipital posterior, that means that his head is up, the occipital portion of the baby's head is up toward mom's back, causes terrific back labor in the first, in that first, first phase of labor. Um, and so, you know, walking, different positioning, trying to get that baby's head to flip. Now, if she goes all the way to complete, and she's still OP, she's still pushes it may be a, take a little longer okay she's gonna get tired on you um because it's harder to push at a baby um op 
I'll kind of with the head up of the observable posterior. Okay, so we take that into consideration. And we have, again, we're going to do different positions. A lot of times I even put my patients in knee chest. You know, if you get on all fours, you can really, you can really feel the, how you, the um, diameter, how the, of your, even your abdomen changes. So sometimes that helps flip those babies around. Okay. All right. So um, the second stage is an important stage to have somebody during, you know, yeah, pushing stage. And we always have encouragement during the second stage of labor. Okay. Now they have an epidural and they're not pushing so effectively. Um, we sometimes, remember I told you I have them sitting up and I, and um, we decrease the amount of epidural medication enough that she can actually feel the need to push. <laughs> okay. Well, that was that exam. So I went over um, that one with you. I hope that you wrote down the highlights, the terms I gave you, because that I I've seen I've seen this repeat itself. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to now share my screen to go over. Um, let me see here. No, excuse me. Uh, let me go back here. Hold on here. Uh, what happened to my screen? Let me just go back over here. The highlights. Um, these are highlights, okay? And as you heard me say from a past HESI um, exam, you'll, you can see some of these. Um, so you're going to have to study a little bit different for HESI than you did for like a unit exam, okay? Unit exams are what we call more focus exams. HESI is like, a, it's, a, it's a final exam. So, um, Gonna maybe go over a little bit of this, and then tomorrow for the HESI review, um, I do I do some other things too. Okay, but remember I told you I was right on this past HESI. Um, it has about um, postpartum assessment. So I mentioned bubble heat. So what you're looking at when you have a patient in postpartum, these are things you have to be looking at. Now I'm gonna tell you LPNs, guys, you can work on the mother baby unit. So um. What your assessment is, you're going to look at, at um, breasts. You're looking at her uterus. Remember, we want it nice and firm. Um, bowel. We want it, first of all, you're going to listen to bowel signs. And um, and she, she's got to have a bowel boom before she goes home. Um, bladder. I'm going to assess the bladder. Make sure it's not full. That would cause, my, um, they cause the patient's uterus to go up and to be displaced or deviated over to the side, okay? Um, lochia, um, it should be lochia rubra. Remember the first couple of days it would be red. Shouldn't really have a, a bunch of clots. Maybe have a little, maybe a small, small ones, the size of maybe a dime, very small, small little ones, but not that much. That means if it's too much, I gotta make sure my fundus is firm and um, if not, I'm thinking, okay, what's going on? Do I have any retained placenta? If I have a soft bulky uterus, I'm thinking um, retained placenta fragments. Okay. And then episiotomy. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, surgical cut in the perineum to allow um, baby to be born. Okay. And you know, the, you know the different degrees, one, two, three, and four. And well, how you want to study it now is, okay, what am I looking at? Okay, and how am I going to take care of this lady? Um, a lot of questions would come from that aspect. Um, Holman sign. Uh, positive Holman sign is never good. You got a DVT. And then emotions. Remember, psych is always part of the, um, it was part of the labor and birth process. It's also part of the postpartum assessment. Okay. All right. So that's your postpartum assessment. And then here's your Holman sign, okay? And again, DVT. 
And here your signs are, it's redness in the calf, pain in the calf. It actually feels real hard and you have some, have some swelling and warmth. Okay, what are you going to do? Early ambulation. All right, do you see how big that is? It's called early ambulation. It's coming off that slide. That's the key to preventing a DVT. Okay, get the blood flowing again. Okay, her legs might have been up in the stirrups um, for a long time delivering. We had more of those years ago when we did have patients that were up in stirrups in the OR when we delivered in the OR. Okay, um, the next area that you have to know is fundal assessment. We've gone over this an awful lot. So in fundal assessment, then you you know if you've got urinary atony or a boggy uterus. And so this is priority, folks, priority. You have to do fundal massage. Now see how I this lady here has one hand right here, this the top of the uterus, and here she has the bottom of the uterus. You can actually feel that uterus in your hand. I have felt many uteruses over the many years. Okay, so here's your medication that you would give um, if you needed to to get this uterus to tone up. Okay, so we have Cytotec that could be given um, rectally or orally. Uh, Methogen. I am, um, make sure you take mom's blood pressure because it does increase heart rate. Um, hemabate, I am, or Pitocin, IV, okay, or I am, okay. Displace uterus, okay. Um, if the uterus is over to the side, it, there you are. So here, this is what I've been talking about. Here's the bladder. See how the bladder lays underneath the uterus? So here's the bladder. It gets really full looking, okay? It causes this uterus to be without tone, okay? Boggy. So what am I going to do? And look how it's over. It's over to deviate it to the side, okay? So again, I use the least invasive. I'll ask her, uh, put her on the bedpan and try to get it to void. If not, I've got to catheterize her. There's no, no doubt about it, okay? <clears throat> Here's your stages of lochia. Okay, so this is nice because this comes right out of your book and it shows you the lochia rubra, which is really nice and dark. Okay, it's really bright red and um, um, it's a heavy flow. And then here, in some books, it's all quite some books, but about three days. Okay, and I said, says small clocks clots are normal. And what a HESI question would be, would give, they would give you the um, scenario describing this and you have to know the difference between looking at rubra or serosa, okay? Or here you've got alba, okay? So again, um, this, this is more pinkish brown um, type coloring. It has now mucus and blood, but it's more watery, more mucusy than anything. Um, and it's less blood. Um, this goes about four to 12 days depend on what book you're reading and it's more of a moderate flow now some of this <clears throat> you know how that color um gets from um pinkish brown because brown means it's old blood i mean she's laying blood up there that's coming out and here's your lucia alba it's very is um very whitish looking okay um doesn't look like this at all right so this has more of a wbc's in it and is more um, mucus no more blood okay now you have to make sure that when you send your patient home and you do discharge planning that um if she if she now is like say postpartum say 14 days okay she should be alba right but now she woke up one morning and she's got rubra she got bright red bleeding okay she needs to know that that's not normal, and that she needs to call the doctor's office. She needs to call her doctor immediately, immediately. And why? Because it could be that she has retained placenta fragments. Okay. Now, if you don't do anything, she doesn't know to do it. She can be at home hemorrhaging. Not a good sign. Okay, so here's your early signs of postpartum hemorrhage. And um, again, a boggy uterus is a uterus without tone, uterine atony. Um, soaking a perineal pad. Yeah, you have a large gush of blood, locally of or clots. 
um, she could have a slow constantly. What's that? That's like a, that's from a laceration. Um, you got your lacerations, you got perineal area, you got the reproductive tract. I mean, a lot of things can bleed after delivery. Um, and then you got, if she has severe pain in the perineum, um, that remember I said it is like unrelenting pain is that's pain that's when you treat it, it doesn't, doesn't get any relief. You think a hematoma, look down there and see. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, for nursing care for postpartum hemorrhage. Now, how many questions that was on this last HESI? Um, it was about five. So you got to know. Okay. And you not only know about it, but you got to know what am I looking at and how I'm going to help my patient. What am I, what's my nursing actions? Okay. So I'm going to always watch for signs of shock. So if you don't know those signs of shock, know them. Okay. Um, continuous pulse oximeter. Oh yeah. I'm going to use that. And I, I pulse oximeter will give me uh, not only the oxygenation concentration in the um, blood, it also give me a heart rate. Low key assessment. Okay. Um, how much? Uh, what color? And do I have do I have clots? And how many clots? And always know the size of the clot. When you look at a clot, you clot you want to look, look at how big they are. So I always compare it to like you have nickels, you have a dime, nickel, um, size quarter, half a dollar. Um, so you have all those. Okay. Or you know if it's half a dollar, you can do a set centimeter. Um, measurement too. Okay. And then you got funnel assessment. We talked about that. It's high and over to the side, a lot of distension. Boggy or soft, uterine atene. Firm in midline, but still bleeding. Okay. You got a perineal laceration. Now, I've seen questions where they give you, they, they, they give you a scenario and they tell you the patient's fundus is firm and it's midline, but she's still bleeding. You're thinking, okay, now I've got a laceration problem. Remember the trickle of blood? It accumulates and um, you can get a significant amount of blood. Okay. Um, what I want to do is weigh my pads, okay, and measure IV fluids. What I do too is I lay my pads out and I see the time. Um, that's always a good thing. Um, so that you don't say, well, about one o'clock, I think, I think it was one, or then, and then the second one, oh, I think, no, nurses have to be exact. So if I'm going to do a pad count, I'm going to do it right. So I lay my pads down on the blue chucks, I put the time on it, and then I know my, and I can see them too. I can see if they're scant or they're saturated. Okay. All right. Um, Hypovolemic shock. Okay, this is a really good slide. It's rapid bleeding and the depleted blood volume cannot refill fast enough. Mm -hmm. You just can't. So do I want her to lose a lot of blood? No, 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 no. Do I want to jump on that uterine atony? Yes, 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 yes. Um, my first sign and my earliest sign is tachycardia. Then my, what happens then is then you, blood pressure will go down. Um, my kidneys will get effect, will be affected, so I'll have decreased urinary output. Um, skin will be pale, and she might be clammy and diaphoretic. And then you have a patient who is anxious and restless and confused and fatigued. Okay, but here's your um, earliest sign is tachycardia. All righty. Hang in there with me a little longer. Uh, this is a great picture of a hematoma. You can see uh, that this is very painful. Okay. Okay. So I think I've gone over that. This is what it looks like. This lady will have difficulty in urinating. Um, patients I've had that had this could not urinate. So I had to do a Foley catheter very painful. I medicated her before I would put a Foley in uh, because it is so painful, but even that was hard hard to because um, it doesn't take away the pain. Okay. All right. She could have signs of hypolemic shock and 
hopefully it will kind of resolve itself um and but it might need draining but that really is painful we usually put them out for that okay here's your fungal height postpartum um you can see again the bladder's down here right and here's your uterus displaced by a full bladder okay and here's your fungal height it shows you so day one of postpartum where is it is at the level of the umbilicus and then every day it goes down by what? One centimeter, okay? And it keeps going down, keeps going down until it goes way down here in the simplest pubis and then you no longer kind of feel it, okay? Um, I always tell my my um, my patients too, if I want to get them to, um, uh, I want them breastfeeding. <laughs> we say, if you go ahead and breastfeed, this involution process goes a little faster. And then guess what, guys? You can wear your skinny jeans. <laughs> and I usually can get somewhere with that. All right. Um, sub involution. So what I describe here, I'm describing here is involution, right? Okay, so that means the uterus is descending um down to his pre-pregnancy state. When you have sub involution, mm, there's a delay, it's not gonna be involute as much, it's slower than we expected. Um, and it's usually caused by an infection or retained placenta fragments. Okay, remember we talked about that, right? That's why the importance of teaching her about the lochia, because that's what she'll see. Um, she won't be touching her fundus, even though I do teach my patients um, to when they go home to feel that fundus. Um, but anyway, uh, caused by infection. So. That's called subinvolution. So you can see here that you know the uterus is still pretty big. Um, uterine atony. Okay, this is a uterus that's just soft and boggy, has no, has no tone. Okay, retained placenta. Here's the retained placenta, and you know it doesn't cause much to, um, you know that's why when the uh, it doesn't uh, put it this way, it doesn't need to be a real big piece to cause a big problem. Okay, it could be a small little retained placenta and cause a big problem. That's why when the placenta is delivered during the what stage of labor? Third stage. Okay, um, they um, we look at the placenta. You know, nurses will look at the placenta and we'll look at the Duncan side because that's the maternal side and look and see um, if the lobes are are intact. Okay, if they're not, then there's a piece missing and we need to retrieve it. Okay, so it would be the physician or the midwife there that would go back up and kind of do a clean sweep and um, try to see it get out. Now, here we have a little diagram of DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. And this is a defect, um, as you can see. And so she becomes what we call a free bleeder. Okay. Cervical lacerations, you can see here, it's a little cut. It won't take much. Remember, this is a very vascular area. It is full of blood, so it would bleed. So that's a cervical. And here, the vaginal laceration would be right here. So you can see she can lacerate from a big baby, um, a precipitous delivery, things like that can happen. All right. And then you have your peritoneal lacerations which is what your episiotic. Okay, so if she's at home and she starts bleeding again and, and um, she may have to come back in and because we have to probably um, do a, a dilatation curatage um, to get out those placenta fragments. Okay, here's your slide on, on postpartum infection and endometriitis. This was a test question. I know that for certain it was. And so what I was asking for was, um, let's see if I can find it. Okay, so the nurse assesses the postpartum client that's five weeks post-delivery. Okay, five weeks. During the clinic visit, the client states that she's had a foul smelling, vaginal dis vaginal drainage, pelvic discomfort, and a low-grade fever. So the nurse relates these findings to which of the following? 
Okay, well, here's your endometriitis. So it's infection of the lining of the uterus, is it not? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what the question asked. Um, can be caused by a surgical site infection, like a C-section. Mm -hmm. um, can be caused by bacteria entering during childbirth, right? Things can happen. So here, you, here's your signs and symptoms. Low-grade fever. So your patient has, um, let's see, and a low-grade fever. It's right there, low-grade fever. Pelvic discomfort, right there. And foul smelling. So the question was asking, the nurse relates these findings to which of the following? Is it involution? No, because we know what involution is. It's the um, descent of the uterus back down to its pre-pregnancy state. So that one's out. Urinary tract infection? No, because it's telling you in the question. So if you if you read the question real quick in the beginning and you go, uh, maybe it's that one, or I think the other one, maybe endometriitis, but then think in the question. So go back to the question, and here it, st it tells you that she has foul-smelling vaginal drainage. Foul-smelling vaginal drainage. Do you see that right there? Yeah, it's right there. Okay. Now, um, pelvic discomfort mm -hmm, is right on design and symptoms, and a low-grade fever. It tells you, it's giving you all the signs and symptoms of the infection called endometriitis. So the answer to that one is endometriitis. Okay. And you can see here, you see here, inflammation of the endometrium. Remember the endometrium is what? The middle layer inside, right? It's inside the uterus, the lining of the uterus. So here you go, guys. The lining is all inflamed. She would have a foul smelling. Well, yeah, sure. Whatever's coming out is going to be foul smelling. And then she's got pelvic discomfort and pain. That alone looks painful. And then she's got a fever because she got an infection in the body. And the body is what? You know, her own immune system is trying to what? Get rid of it. Okay. So here's your normal endometrium. Doesn't it look pretty? Yeah, it is. So you see the difference. Okay. So we may have to be readmitted. Um, she probably goes to the ER and um, she'll have um, antibiotics. Okay. She needs to be treated. Okay. Here's another infection called mystitis. Okay. And um, it looks like a little, like, like orange, right? Orange peel. Okay. So it's a breast infection. It does cause breast pain and flu-like symptoms. Okay. Again, it can go through the cracks of the nipples. Okay. Broken skin. Okay. That's why make sure that baby latches on properly. Signs and symptoms. So his redness and heat in the breast, breast tenderness, edema, heaviness in the breast, and possible um, purlent, which is pus, drainage. Again, they'll probably give you the signs and symptoms. You have to know what that is. So this time is what? in the breast. So that tells me alone that it's mastitis. Okay. What are you going to, what's going to be done for this lady? Antibiotics and analgesics. Uh -huh. um, heat can help open the ducts and provide relief. Sometimes a warm shower heating pad are good options. It, and also that warm shower also helps with milk flow. So I unlike the warm shower. Okay, frequent emptying is necessary. And so usually um, one breast, two to three weeks postpartum. It's usually, yeah, it's called unilateral. Um, that means it happens to what? One breast, okay. And that's how they put it too. All right, here's your pupural or postpartum sepsis. So infection that spreads to other organs as a result of a postpartum infection. Not good. So. If you've got infections such as endometriitis or mastitis, okay, we just went over those. You got cracked nipples. That's an entry, correct? Okay. Site of infection, C-section, pesiotomy. Those are all opportune areas for what? Infection, for bacteria to seep in and get into her bloodstream. Never good. Uh, perineal repair infection, that's the episiotomy, open wound at placenta site, inside, remember I told you that area where the placenta comes off, 
it creates like an open wound there. Okay. All right. So that's another um, opportun opportunist area for infection. And then you could have tissue drop. So what do you got? Well, first of all, we're going to use standard precautions. Absolutely good hand washing. And I'm going to look, my patient would have a fever. And this time, 100.4 or greater. Um, fever starts after the first 24 hours postpartum and can last at least two days. These patients are sick and usually occurs in the first 10 days postpartum. So, could she go home and still get an infection, have an infection? Sure. Okay. All right. Okay. Postpartum depression is, is a serious problem. Um, with depression, uh, the onset is like two to four weeks after delivery. Remember, you have the baby blues, okay? And that can happen. But now we're talking about, I'm not talking about baby blues here. I'm talking about depression. So I wanted to make sure you're, you're not falling asleep on me. And yes, postpartum depression, okay? It happens again two to four weeks after delivery. So that's why you have to know the difference between baby blues, depression, and psychosis. The reason why is they'll give you to, give you in, in a scenario, and then you have based on that information, like okay, patient is three weeks postpartum. All right, ha ha, three weeks. That means what? Could be depression. Now I'm going to find out more about what's going on. Okay, so what happens? She has some thoughts of self harm, and she just lacks enjoyment in life, guys. Just lacks enjoyment in life. Um, things that she used to like like a lot <laughs> they're gone she doesn't find the, the things she's disinterested um she has intense feelings of inadequacy unworthiness guilt or inability to cope um she has a loss of mental concentration and the inability to make decisions um she may have some disturbed sleep or appetite and some constant fatigue and feeling of ill health. Okay. So if you don't know the difference between baby blues now and postpartum depression and psychosis, go back into that area and review it. Go into your HESI book. So here's a really nice slide on all of them. So just be make sure that you understand them. So psychosis is extremely dangerous. And I told you about my patient that I took care of when I was a very, actually I was a student nurse. So, you know, and they just, I came on the night shift. I was, I, I was this nursing assistant too at the time. And um, they just put me in this room with this lady. He had, didn't tell me anything, but I knew something was, wasn't right. I mean, this lady was like extreme depressed. I mean, she wasn't talking she wasn't looking at me she didn't you know she didn't communicate you know they took everything out of there that could be a possible um aid for suicide you know um so it was really bad okay um the baby came in but came in with the nursery nurse and i was there and another nurse and um we she, you know but she wasn't even interested in the baby okay um these people can actually hear voices and um, they may have um, ideations of their own suicide, but also we call this infant side where they kill the baby and then they kill themselves. Okay. And I tell you the, the population that has a big problem with this falls under um, bi bipolar or major depression before pregnancy. Remember a while back, Okay, uh, we talked about the interview and what we want to get the OB history and her medical history. We also get her psych history, do we not? And patients that come in depressed before pregnancy, remember I said we kind of put a red flag to them, that's the old term, and, you know, make sure that we're well aware of her history. Okay, and a lot of times they may have to go to a psych ward, like my patient went to a psych ward. Okay, so here's another slide that you can read about baby blues. Remember, first two weeks, okay, postpartum depression, okay, and then you got psychosis, okay. 
this is your nursing care for term newborn. Um, it's a really good slide. Again, wearing standard precautions is wearing gloves and good hand washing. Um, you want to assess the baby's risk factors. Is this baby LGA, SGA, or AGA? Mom's condition, does she have gestational diabetes or preeclampsia? Um, group beta strep, her status and treatment. Okay, mom, a uh, baby that gets born through a positive GPS environment can have respiratory distress syndrome or highland memory disease. So that's why we need to know, and pediatricians are really, really on top of this. Every woman has to have a culture on their chart. If you don't, um, then we treat it as it's positive. Okay, she'll get, um, they will, a person who's positive for group beta strep will get antibiotics. Okay. And then you have um, keep the baby dry and warm. Remember, we don't cold stress a baby out because baby uses too much of their own blood sugar to keep warm. And to and they're breathing really fast too. So we don't want to. We want to make sure we put a little hat on this baby's head because he loses a lot of body head, body heat through the head. Um, cover him with nice warm blankets, and you have skin to skin with mom. Always nice. Okay, bulb suctioning, um, mouth, then nose. She puts it as M before N. Okay, I always put it as what's bigger? <laughs> mouth. <laughs> mouth is bigger, so go for the mouth and then the nose, okay? Because um, it breathes it wide too. I tell you, if you go put the bulb syringe in the nose, the uh, baby can actually aspirate on whatever mucus is in the mouth. So you don't want to do that. So that's why you do the mouth first. Don't put it where in the middle of his mouth. You put it on the side and 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 suck out. Okay. And we tell mommies, we we not tell, I should say we we teach mommies how to do it. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, we're gonna give this baby an Afgar score. Remember, Dr. Virginia Apgar and her Apgar score tells um, the practitioner or the nurse um, how much, what level of resuscitation this infant needs. It's right on your HESI book. Um, and it's a nice little table. And it's real simple. Okay. So look that up. Port assessment. You have three vessels, two arteries, and one vein. So remember the mnemonic um, AVA. Um, you're going to have, you can do a, a brief assessment and you can do the APGAR score right on mom's chest. Yes, you can. And then, um, and I went over that already with you, but yeah, we want skin to skin and we want bonding. Skin to skin is not only good to keep the baby warm, but it promotes bonding. Okay. And then we talk about knowing the baby's vital signs mm -hmm. and giving meds. Okay. And in a baby, the last thing you take on the vital signs is the temperature. Yeah, they get kind of aggravated when you take their temperature. So you can't listen to the apical pulse on a baby if the baby's crying. So that's why you go ahead and the temperature is the last thing. Okay. All right. And here's our little Apgar. Uh, this is a great, great slide. My colleague put this together. So here you go. Appearance. Am I blue? If I'm blue, I'm a zero. If I'm, um, my body is pink, see? But my hands and my feet are blue, that's, give me a one. That's called acrocyanosis. If my whole body is pink, that's a two. Okay. Then under pulse. If I have a heartbeat, Boom, 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 boom. I'm, I'm okay. If I have no heartbeat, I get zero. If I have a heartbeat, but it's less than 100, then I get a one. Okay. But I'm greater than 100, I get a two. Because I'm, I'm my heart doing really well. A grimacing. Okay. So G is for grimace and response to simulation. If I have a baby that's just laying there, guys, like he's got no movement, not good. Um, he grimaces or got a weak cry. We cry. I'm doing something, folks. Give me at least at least a one. And then this one, I'm crying, which I just love when my babies are crying. Um, is a two. Yeah, activity. Did I come out? Um, I got I got activity. 
yeah, you got son, you're active, you know, you're responding. Hey, nurse. Okay, I got two. If I'm just kind of laying there, you know, kind of like, like I'm, I'm here, but I'm chilled out, you know, nurse. I got a one. If I have no movement whatsoever, I'm going to get a big fat zero. Okay. And then respiration. If I'm not breathing, folks, because rest breathing is my hardest job that I have to do at birth, is it not? Okay. So I have no respirations. I get a big fat what zero. If I got some and it's irregular, but I'm not, my, I'm trying. I get a one, but I've got a nice strong cry. That's why I said I love my babies with cry because they have a nice strong cry. I give them a two. So imagine you got a nice, healthy baby. You got a strong cry. He's active. He's crying. The heart rate is above 100. And he's all pink at five minutes. He's perfect. So two, four, what? Six, eight, ten. He's at five minutes. He got a 10. Okay. Now here's your scoring. Oh, this is just so nice. Um, From seven to 10 is a good prognosis. We're doing good. Um, from four to six, um, you might need to do some in interventions, you know, maybe drying the baby, some stimulation. Sometimes they just come out, they just need some good drying off. Um, you know, I used to do their little feats. Okay, baby, you can give me a response now, you know, and uh, they respond. But zero to three, they'll need some um, oxygen. And remember, we're very careful with oxygen with all newborns, okay? Um, we do we put a little pulse oximetry on them to know. And um, an O2 saturation rate, 92% um, um, and greater, okay, is what I expect. Okay, and that was on your test too. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Yeah, the nurse is assessing the pulse like symmetry of a preterm infant. So which of the following indicates a normal reading? So the correct answer was oxygenation saturation of 92% or greater. That's actually one of my PowerPoints that I put that on. So there you go. Okay. All right. So um, that should, oh, he's got some reflexes here. This is good. Um, so a lot of times on my past HESI exams, and that's why I put it on your HESI concepts, is about reflexes on a baby, especially the ones that they need to survive. Survival reflexes. Um, sucking um, is one. Gagging is a, another um, one that they need to be able to get things up. Okay. So these are what we call um, survival ones. Um, here you have rooting, you know, and uh, moral reflex. That's your startle reflex. That's how come I can get a good, good uh, response from the baby is that his little hands go up in the air and he has a little startle. Um, crawling reflex, Babinski reflex is the only time that you can get a positive re Babinski um, response by uh, taking in your hand and going um, over the sole of the foot. Let me just get rid of this picture for a minute and you can see it. You see, and just gently, and we get up, see how everything flares out and we get a positive response. That would be um, positive. And you're able to have a positive when you're, when you're just born. Okay. Then you have the walking reflex and mommy's think, oh, my baby can walk. No, it's just when the baby puts his foot down, um, he feels the bottom of the surface kind of cold and he flans up okay then you have the grasping which is called the palmer reflex and they can hold your little finger in his hand this is always a beautiful sight when they do that okay so that's your reflex remember um the golden hour, um hours are called the golden hour uh first hour of life and again it's spent with mom um, skin to skin with mom if possible of course everything is good okay uh, make sure they have a good app bar make sure we get proper bonding with mom uh, you do frequent vital signs every 30 minutes on baby after 
you know, they're doing just fine. Uh, brief assessment for any abnormalities can be done. Um, and then medication administration, we talked about uh, erythromycin eye ointment. We give it in a ribbon, ribbon, R-I-B-B-O-N um, kind of format um, onto the lower conjunctiva, okay? And then, of course, vitamin K uh, and hepatitis B. So that was on HESI 2, and I just went over that, so I told you to know that. And then breastfeeding initiation. Um, I tell you what, breastfeeding is most successful if it's done in the first hour. That's why we call that the golden hour. Um, get get mom, get baby. Now, mom, too, um, when baby breastfeeds, um, what happens when baby when baby breastfeeds, um, it causes um, her own oxytocin to be produced from the pituitary. And that's another way of giving that uterus to be more, to be firm. Okay. So not only am I giving IV oxytocin, say, I also got baby on breasts. Win-win. I love it. So it has a, a lot of great benefits for um, for breastfeeding and baby after delivery. And here you go. Here's the the erythromycin eye gel, okay? And then you got the vitamin K I M. And uh, what it does, um, it does stimulate the clotting and RBCs to prevent a hemorrhage, and especially in the brain. Okay, all right. And then you got your hepatitis B. Um, it's hepatitis members, uh, hepatitis B is a liver infection that can be asymptomatic. So we don't want babies to get um, hepatitis B. Okay. All right. And skin. Um, skin. This is what we see on the baby's skin. Um, Miller, that was on your exam too. Uh-huh. Exam number three. And um, again, small white pimple looking spots. They're, they're not pimples. Um, we don't. We tell mom not to pop them. Just leave them alone. Then you have erith um, erythema toxin. This is what it looks like. Remember erythema, and it's red and is a blotchy red rash. It could be anywhere on the body. So it should go away in a few weeks. And here's your Mongolian spots. On um, their flat, they look like bruises. On the back, back or buttocks. Um, doesn't require any treatments, no creams, nothing. Um, they can they can fade. Okay, this is what I was talking about the last time I talked to you about these um, on the integumentary system of the baby. Um, you if you have a baby that comes in, you know these could be also you think um, child abuse. So you be very careful when you're assessing these babies. Okay, then I'd like to show you here. Um, central cyanosis, which is in what the baby's trunk versus acrocyanosis. So you see here low oxygen flow to the central organs. Not a good thing. It does require stimulation and resuscitation. Okay. Now here's your acrocyanosis. Um, you you know just needs a little more time to get blood. Um, to the peripherals. That's what that is. Remember, um, blood flow has to go to the vital organs first, and then um, and then it goes out to the peripherals, which is the hands and feet. All right, here's your newborn vital signs. Remember, I've been telling you to know this. Um, so respiratory rate is 30 to 60. If you know the norm, you can pick up the abnormal. And that's what HESTI would do is they would give you um, a scenario and they would tell you what the baby's respiratory rate is or heart rate or temperature, oxygenation, saturation, 92% or greater, weight and length and head and chest. Okay. This is what happens when you have poor control of body temperature. You can see the skin and how modeling it looks. Okay. Looks like marbling somewhat too. Lethargic, bradycardia, 
increased respiratory rate with periods of apnea. It goes so fast that they, they lose their breath and they have a decrease in skin temperature. When you're when you got a question like this, and they're, maybe they ask you all that all that apply. Make sure that you read what's actually on the paper, and that was in your head. Um, on I think it was on this this um, one too. It had it, and um, you have to be very very careful that you know it says decrease or increase. Read it slowly. It'd be a shame to lose a question because you read it was increase instead of decrease. Just be very careful, please. All right, so we're going to keep this baby warm. And um, keeping a preterm is even more challenging. Um, heat loss can be caused by many factors. And that's when you have your um, thermal reg regulatory systems. So no uh, convection, um, conduction, radiation, and evaporation. And, um, and how... How are we going to know their body temperature? Is we just going to use a um, temperature probe on the radiant warmer? Okay, that was on that HESI test from last one too. Okay, I'm going to go real quick on this because this is about the newborn intestinal tract. It was on HESI. Um, remember, the first one is your meconium, so it's like a black, tarry, sticky look of stuff here. And that's for the first couple of days. Then it goes into transitional where you have, you know, you know, it's a little bit different, brownish green, less sticky. Okay. And then you go into a normal breastfeeding. You see here? And then it goes into like another transition. And then here's your normal breastfeeding. And it is what? Yellow, yellow and seedy. Okay. All right. Um, this goes over garbage feeding and it was on your test. And what you have to do always before you're going to put in more food into a baby system, you're going to first aspirate the contents first. Aspirate first. And then if you get you don't get um residual, we call you know, you don't get anything back up, then you know you're good to go. You mean that means that all Everything that you put down there before has been digested, okay? All right, because you don't want to put more into a baby because his stomach is so small. You don't want to put more into a baby if you still have stuff in there. Okay, okay. And then here's your signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. Nasal flaring, never good. Grunting, Retractions, sternal retractions or intercostal um, retractions, not good. Um, respiratory rate greater than 60 beats per minute and a heart rate less than 110. Respiratory distress. And so if they have respiratory distress, they'll probably go to NICU. Um, uh, could be a cause from lung immaturity or impaired gas exchange. Um, surfactant deficiency, absolutely. Creamy babies. Um, mom gets um, two doses of bethamethasone um, beforehand, before she delivers, to help increase the production of surfactant in the baby's lungs. Um, baby gets delivered, he comes out, he still has respiratory distress. Um, he goes to the NICU. They get him on the monitor, get a pulse oximeter on him, and they give they can give him more surfactant through the E2 tube. They intubate and give the e through the ET. Um, what you're going to see in respiratory distress is tachypnea, <laughs> rapid breathing, swelling, and apnea. Remember, and they said they can be breathing so fast that they're going to lose their breath. Apnea, periods of total sensation of uh, the sens sensation of um, respiratory. Okay, what's your treatment? Remember we talked, I just said, bethamethasone to mom before she delivers, okay? Um, what are you going to do with this baby after he's born? You can give it um, gypsofactin. Everything you do for this baby, you're going to do it in clusters. We call it cluster care. And then check his vital signs. And then, of course, oxygen. Be very, very careful with oxygen. Remember, uh, We've had the pulse oximetry on, and it's 92% or greater for a normal um, baby. But um, 
if you give too much oxygen, you can cause them to have bronchial pulmonary um, dysplasia. What happens is you're actually damaging the bronchi and tissue destruction. Not good. So here's a good picture of a normal alveoli. Okay. And here's a collapse. Yeah, it doesn't look too good. Okay. This was on your exam number three also. All right. Here's your fontanelles. So they're still open at birth. See how the head is, okay? This allows this allows the head to mold, okay? And that's why you ever hear the expression cohens, okay? Now, the reason why I want to show you is because this is a depressed fontanelle, and that indicates dehydration, depressed fontanelle. This is a bulging fontanelle, and that means you have increased intracranial pressure. Maybe with hydrocephalus, okay, large head. You see how shiny his scalp is? He's got pressure on the brain. Got very visible scalp veins. Um, you're gonna measure his head and you wanna see you, you know how how much he he's um if it enlarges. He's gotta have a shunt put in. They have a shunt put in to decrease the amount of fluid. Mm -hmm. Um and you want to put him in a semi fowl position to reduce the pressure on the head. Patient, baby pain response. Do babies have pain? Yes, they do. What happens? Their heart rate will increase. Their respiratory rate increases. Blood pressure increases. Um, they have pain related to a circumcision. Yeah, they do feel pain. Oxygenation saturation will decrease. Okay, and blood... Glucose increases because he's he's trying to feel better, right? So he's going to use everything he got. So this is um, a really nice pain scale, and so you got the um, FLA CC. You got the cries, PIP. This is premature. This is neonate and get neonate. So um, this is your categories, and this is the FLA CC. Okay. Oh, circumcision. Circumcision, um, I, um, like I said the other day, it's a completely personal choice. It could be religious factors such as the Jewish faith. They have a breast um, that's done about seven days after delivery. Um, procedure, always have to educate the parents on the procedure. Let them make a decision. Like again, it's very personal choice. You always have to have a consent form. And... Um, you know, you want to keep the baby warm. You don't want the cold stress the baby out while doing a circumcision. And always have a bowl syringe nearby for suctioning. Here's our baby with clep lip and clep palate. Clep palate, clep lip, and palate DBA. Here's a nice picture of it here. So here's your clep palate here. And here's your lip and palate. The main thing about this is these babies get um, middle ear infections. And you, and you can kind of see that by um, the way this is like configured here. And um, they have really a lot of, the problem with these babies is nutrition, guys. Nutrition. You must ensure that this baby has adequate nutrition. Here's a Down syndrome baby, okay? Again, these, these, this Down syndrome um, is only confirmed with an amniocentesis, okay? You have a screening test, and the screening test can be done like 16, 18 weeks gestation, but that's only a screening. If you get a positive test, then you have to go on with an amniocentesis. Okay, now that was on your exam three also. And jaundice. This is a baby under phototherapy. You um, And reason is, uh, remember, everything in this baby is really immature. So you've got immature liver. He gets yellowing of the skin and she's nose. Uh, pathological jaundice. Um, that's your ABO incompatibility. Your orange negative bombs. Um, that 
that is pathological happens in the first 24 hours. Okay. So that's more ABO incompatibility. Um, that's not good. Okay. Not a good thing to have in the first 24 hours. You got to jump on it. Um, breast milk jaundice occurs about day four. Okay. So yeah, about three to four. Bilirubin levels do peak around five days of life. That's why you see that pathological show up. And treatment is phototherapy. The main thing is you want to um, prevent cornicterus and avoid continuing increase. Okay, you want to, and how um, this baby has a real big diaper on, but a lot of times we don't even put that big diaper on them because um, I want more of the skin to be exposed to the ultraviolet light. And remember, see, baby, baby's got his eyes covered, and we went over that already in lecture. Okay, here's your hip dysplasia. Just that um, the head of the femur is partly or completely displaced as a result of a, sh what happens is that hip socket? is kind of short shallow okay so that's why and you can see the gluteal folds are uneven okay all right and then spina bifida here you have a men, um, sac that's outside that's got and this has got to be protected so you put a sterile um, wet um, sterile saline cover over it keep it moist okay um never good uh, to see that um, it really affects the rest of their lives so prevention would be the best thing to do would be folic acid and then treatment you have surgery and this little baby would have to go to habit habitation okay nursing care i just said sterile moist gauze the size of the sac is checked any tears are leaking, want to make sure that it's not leaking and no tears. Um, and then you want to measure the head circumference too, because usually with spina bifida, they usually have a problem with the hydrocephalus. And here's your neonatal absence syndrome, baby. So I would definitely know the symptoms um, of these babies. And member is persistent yawning and recurrent sneezing. Um, they always like to have those on tests. And um, it, it, babies are exposed to opiates or amphetamines during the um, pregnancy because everything crosses the placenta and baby gets addicted. So what, do you, what is your treatment gonna be, okay? So we're gonna keep this baby all snugly, okay? You have to reduce stimuli and noise. They can take a lot of noise. Um, observe procedures and encourage breastfeeding. Good bonding. Quiet. Very quiet. Again, no neonatal absence syndrome. You have to make sure that mom's not taking any drugs, right? Okay. All right. Here's your PKU. Um, and... What we're looking at, PKU, is a buildup of, um, oh, just an edit, it's a faulty metabolism of fetal filing, okay? And um, it's found in proteins. So what happens, um, we get too much, okay? Baby's not able to break it down. And so um, it gets a buildup of fetal filing. It can cause uh, mental disabilities. And the diagnosis um, is done by just a heel stick, but it's called a Goffrey test. It's a special blood test. And treatment. Treatment is baby's going to be lifelong treatment, special formula. We don't want the baby like low phenolic. We can put them on. Um, that's a substitute. Um, maybe partial breastfeeding. Maybe. So according to um, the practitioner, and repetitive labs and work always with a dietitian. This is lifelong. All right. I'm going to be um, go a little bit into this slide and then I'm going to call a quiz for tonight because um, I do have a HESI review tomorrow. Uh, metabolic disease is called maple syrup urine disease. And these again is caused by a defect in metabolism of the chain of amino acids. And um, 
it can cause death within two weeks of left untreated and how you pick it up it has um a sweet smell like maple syrup to earwax or urine or sweat so early detection is the key and hydration and sometimes dialysis peritoneal dialysis and again special formula glycosemia the body is unable to use the carbohydrates glycotose and lutose, lactose main thing is they cannot have any cows milk dairy products okay um begins abruptly and gets worse gradually it can lead to like vomiting hypotonia which is no tone diarrhea failure to thrive and jaundice and um you have to remove the cow's milk and lactose containing products from the diet so you can use lactose free or soy formulas all right and here you got meconium aspiration syndrome. This is where with the baby breathes in the meconium. Um, he has meconium still in utero. He gets born. So he probably has some in his lungs. And then he inhales meconium at delivery. And um, it happens a lot to pa patient, uh, babies that are post-term. Okay. And um, these symptoms... You have nasal flaring, you have retraction, cyanosis, grunting, and tachypnea, and rails and rock eye. They might need like NICU observation or admission and tachypnea, rapid breathing can persist. These babies are can be very sick. Um, these can so when a baby is born, a baby has, has had his first bowel wound in utero. When he's born, what happens is that the head comes out. And we'll go ahead and suction right there at the perineum, okay? And then um, we don't stimulate this baby to cry. No, we don't stimulate it. We take the baby out to the radium warmer. RT, respiratory therapy is there with the NICU nurse. And they go ahead and intubate and get the more meconium up. They go deeper into their suctioning. All right, and just to let you know, some newborn size, um, SGA is called small for gestational age. And these are babies born with problems such as the NAS, okay? So neonatal absence syndrome. They don't grow. They're not in a good area environment to grow. AGA is just called average for gestational age. They, they're, they're, they're the expected size for the gestational age. And then you have your LGA. These are large babies, large for gestational age. And many babies are born to diabetic moms or gestational diabetes or, you know, pre-existing LGA. All right. And the term post-term is born after 42 weeks gestation. And aging, because what happens? Aging placenta and decreased functioning. Post maturity or post mature uh, mature syndrome. Okay, that's a new term. Post mature meconium. They can have meconium aspiration. They can be hypoxic and difficult delivery. These are your LGAs that have um, shoulder dystocia. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay, so that was a pretty intense review today. Um. And I will um, do another HESI review tomorrow also. Okay. All right. Have a good evening, everybody. Keep studying, please. Thank you. Bye-bye.